so um, th thanks again, Vinny, my second time here. Is this all right with the microphone? And uh, always a treat to come back, and especially to have the most important topic of the two-topic session uh, be something that I'm presenting a paper on. Let me first uh, give credit to co-authors, Alexander, who you saw yesterday present, Lucas at Alberta, Mitch at University of Arizona, Honest at Bocconi, five-authored paper. I recommend it strongly if you have a team that can work together, and we have all done pretty well on this. Many of you might be looking like, I don't think I want to do that. But um, let's get right into it with 25 minutes. Topic is renewable governance, good for the environment, question mark. So my first attempt at a clever title in 20 years of research, I, I hope it makes sense. So what we're trying to do here is basically say, all right, if institutional investors or just general outside investors are interested in improving sustainability, big picture, what can they do to make it happen? And is it just enough to go out and say, hey, companies that we're trying to engage with, you should make better you know, investments in the environment to improve performance in the long run? And then what are some of the frictions that might prevent that from happening, et cetera? And is governance one of those frictions, one of those things that just you really need to think about first before you get into the environment? So that's kind of a big picture takeaway. To kind of motivate it, uh, Zach's paper with Laura and Philip recently looks at institutional investors and basically asks them a lot of questions. And one of the findings from this survey of institutional investors is that environmental risks have actual financial risks and that these have begun to materialize. So you kind of look around and say, what do the institutional investors think on a variety of subjects, and especially on environmental sustainability? And they're saying, we need to move faster. These are real, actual risks that are starting to hit our portfolio firms. And then what might they do about it, again, from their survey that's forthcoming, risk management and engagement is important to address these risks, not divestment. So this old, like, I'll just sell it if you don't like it, that's not the current thinking of the institutional investors that are looking at trying to improve sustainability. So then a natural question is, all right, they're institutional investors or just general outside investors, they should have power, they should be able to get what they want. So why would they start wondering whether they need governance to make this happen, or put another way, why would they, as outside investors, be concerned that insiders' choices when it comes to environmental performance will not be the optimal amount of investment today for long-run benefit? And if you really think about it, something that was brought up yesterday, the main problem always when you're looking at spending cash now and you're in charge of a firm for some future long-term benefit you may not even for sure know is going to exist when you're around is this short-term oriented problem. So you can imagine if outside investors want something to happen and the insiders know it's going to cost money today for something in the future that they may or may not get credit for, you, you're going to possibly not have the optimal level according to what the outside investors want. In theory, you should be fine because you've got ownership, so that gives you control rights. But many people in this room have spent time studying international corporate governance and you know that just having ownership stakes doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have your voices heard and you're going to be able to influence the firm. Control rights are only meaningful when there's effective governance. So that's essentially what we're looking at. We're looking at institutional investors and other outside investors that might want better environmental performance. They are probably moving faster on wanting that than the insiders are, plus the insiders already have short-termism problems where they don't necessarily want to invest in this necessary investment for sustainability to be improved over time for the firm, and then does governance play a role in this happening? So does G, governance mechanisms, drive E? That is more governance, better conduits, get your voices heard, better environmental performance. That's what we're basically trying to look at. And then importantly, much of the literature, myself included for 20 years doing this, looks at kind of traditional governance mechanisms. How is the board, are they independent? Do you have some different ways where you, you know, have like non-voting shares or voting shares, things like that. We're trying to go a little bit beyond that in this paper and start looking at what we're calling renewable governance, which is looking specifically at mechanisms that might renew the thinking of the board. And the issue here is the outside investors are wanting this change more rapidly, it seems, than the insiders that control firms are willing to give it to them. So you might need to look beyond just is the board of directors 50% independent and say what's going to actually renew people's thinking. That's, that's our idea behind this renewable governance. So we're going to ask 
what specific aspects of governance provide the greatest impact. So we're going to, in this paper, the way we're kind of packaging it, if you will, is traditional governance mechanisms of the stuff long studied and a couple of renewable or contemporary governance mechanisms that we're trying to look at. So the, contemporary, the traditional governance mechanisms, there's generally two types when you look at the international corporate governance literature. First is it blockholder control. You know, got a lot, a lot of voting rights, so therefore you can do what you want. And then in that particular aspect, being family control is generally the most important because of all the uh, interlinks between families and different business units and things like that where they often effectively fully control a publicly traded firm without necessarily having to have 50% of the shares. And then also measures of outsider control rights long emphasized in the literature, and I'll do this a little bit more in detail in the data, but this is where we're going to pick one well-used measure, which is kind of like the Agarwal measure uh, from RFS a decade ago, where you've got, in this case, six kind of prominent line items, but a lot of this stuff focuses on independent directors. So you're supposed to get this independent voice, but even more recent research says there's limits on independent directors really being independent. So maybe it's time to go study some new governance mechanisms. That's what we're trying to do. So the contemporary governance mechanisms we're looking at are essentially those that will hopefully, plausibly renew the thinking of the board. And these have not been studied, to our knowledge, anywhere as far as having an impact on firms' environmental performance. There's been pieces of some of the more traditional ones, like some measures for agency costs being studied with E, but not these more fresh thinking, how do you get the board to actually change its opinions on things type governance mechanisms. And again, as mentioned, we believe, and the survey evidence shows, there's a gap between outside investors thinking on e-performance and what insiders are willing to do. So the renewal of the thinking of the board may be key. And so that's what we're trying to do. So the two mechanisms that are most useful for studying in our sample are going to be something related to the voting process, where the directors can basically fear, if you will, a little bit the outsiders that have these share ownership rights and thus voting rights. And so we're going to move beyond the director independence and try to go to investor voice. And the specific one, I'll get a couple more uh, slides on it later, majority voting, where you have to elect a director with at least 50% of the votes cast or else the elector or the director is not elected. That gives you a chance to withhold your voice and withhold your vote, I'm sorry, withhold your vote in a meaningful way, and thus the director feels some outside pressure. And then the other is looking for outside pressure sources that are forcing the board to be changed in some meaningful way. And very often that is going to be the push in various countries and just amongst institutional investor clubs for female board representation. So that's going to be another contemporary governance mechanism that we look at. So I've kind of already alluded to this, so I'll go very quickly. Again, the paper's got a lot of tables and has a lot of moving parts, so I don't want to go crazy like a 90-minute seminar. But a one-slide framework on what should be driving the need for you to understand who has the control rights, that is, who is the decision maker when it comes to environmental performance, is you've got this trade-off between the insider short-termism, so managers are generally always going to want to spend less than might be optimal on, on any long-term investment including environmental performance, but then you have these beliefs, because nobody knows for sure how much everybody should spend as a company on environmental performance. So you get this non-pecuniary, that is not a financial benefit, but something that personally helps you, you, as a decision maker, to get the firm to spend more on environmental performance. And so that's going to be you know, something, the warm halo effect, we're doing good, I've got power, I'm trying to fix the climate, and that, that kind of stuff. So those two trade-offs, are going to be part of this framework that's often used in motivating environmental performance sustainability papers from the Benevolent Parole original paper. So what we predict here is that only in one situation will you have in entrenched insiders choosing higher environmental performance. That's only when they have essentially no short-termism problems, they're willing to invest in the long run, and they like to spend even more than the outsiders would want on environmental performance. Every other setting, the better governance you have, that is the better voice and ability to change the thinking of the board, the more environmental performance you'll have because you're overcoming managers' innate short-termism. So that's kind of the idea. Better governance is likely, in most cases, to 
increase environmental performance, and that's what we want to test for and find out if that's true. And to be very clear, we are not taking a stand on whether the increase in environmental performance is in PV enhancing, it's just a trade-off between your outside and inside investors utility from spending on environmental performance versus the insiders that don't want to spend the money because they might not get the benefit from it. So very quickly, the environmental performance data, a little discussion on that. We use what we believe is the most comprehensive data source on this. Used it in an earlier paper, some other papers in top finance journals and the accounting journals have used this same data set. It's an asset for Thomson Reuters, now Refinitiv, and it basically gives you from 2004, pretty good coverage of global firms' environmental performance. And it gives you 70 different line items if you want that level of uh, specificity. And it's, it's a source that investors use because Thompson was one of the first to put this out on investors' desks, so it's got a lot of traction. And they basically do a lot of detailed in-house investigation as well as looking at part of public disclosures and looking at records of media announcements of pollution and things in the government filings of are there troubles and that, that sort of stuff. So we believe it's a pretty comprehensive data source. But let me fully own up that if you read last week's Economist, they say, oh, all these different seven data sources for sustainability all vary in how they rank companies, et cetera. The environmental performance data doesn't have as much variation. There's a study by Bloomberg that shows for this stuff, for E, it's a little more consistent across databases. But but this is, you know, this is just the way it is. It's kind of early stage of trying to benchmark this stuff, and sometimes early stage work is fun because you have to make some decisions about what actually measures environmental performance. So we make two decisions. One, we're going to use Asset 4's proprietary Z-score, in which they aggregate across all the companies they cover each year, all these things into like a black box and say, here for British Petroleum is your Z-score on environmental performance. And it's benchmarked against everybody else they cover in a year. We don't understand that that well. We're going to use it, but we also build our own using the 70 line items that's in the paper where you have things like input measures, output measures, CO2 per unit of revenue, that kind of stuff. And so we track that firm by firm. So that's not going to be subject to how many firms they're covering because it's going to be measured the same way for each firm from 2004 on. So we have our own equally weighted environmental performance score, and we have their asset for Z score. Governance mechanisms, I've already talked about a little bit. Start with traditional stuff. They also have what I call a black box asset for 38 item governance score. Kind of looks like the old conference issue metric stuff. Don't really know exactly what's in there. We start with it, but we don't focus on it. Just to show you how complicated some of these measures are, their governance score actually includes a fair number of sustainability items, which they bucket in governance. So it's just this is why the reputation of the database is sometimes like, what are you actually measuring? So we take those line items and pull them out for that score. But then the real thing we're looking at are more actionable items like, hey, what if you, know, you can observe block over control? And again, family block holder, and we take a lot of care with the data and use the Orbis Osiris databases to track ultimate ownership and have some experience as authors doing this. So we're going to look at like a major core traditional governance mechanism of is the firm controlled by a family or not? And then we want to look at these indicator items that I mentioned. So again, this is kind of like old school corporate governance. Does it matter for e-performance? And this is where it's an index if you have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six boxes checked, or is your board independent 50%, audit committee independent, CEO chair split, board size not too big, multiple voting shares or not, and no staggered elections. So think of the higher that score is, the more you have these traditional better governance mechanisms. Now, as I mentioned, these have their limits because they're basically looking, at least half of them tend to look at independent directors and how independent they are. And Jeff Coles and some co-authors have a nice paper where they basically show if you are a board member, even if you're independent, you're essentially co-opted through at least half the time where you're worried about being reelected or you know you owe your allegiance, et cetera. So if there's the independent directors not really being that independent and the outside investors want more e-performance and companies are willing to provide at least right now, you're going to have to change what you look at in terms of governance. And this is why we come up with this idea of let's look at what's going to renew the mindset of the board. A nice paper by Lucian Bebchuk and co-author say there's three mechanisms. We focus mainly on this majority voting. This is included in that bucket measure but 
majority voting is this one that's powerful because it gives the outside investor voice. That's one of them. And then we also look at the forced poor turnover, as I mentioned, by having female representation. There are a few companies in the global sample that have term limits and age limits explicitly, but it's only about 6% of the sample. So having self-limited board tenure is not going to be something we can investigate. The majority voting has a lot of um, uh, variation in our sample, as does the amount of female board membership has a lot of variation in our sample. So that's what we basically have. Saying it again, majority voting rules where you have to have more than 50% of the votes cast, not just a single director being put up, and if one vote happens, then you've got a plurality and you're elected. You've got to earn your votes, essentially, because a lot of director elections just have a single director standing for election. That's been shown to be important in the literature. Again, don't want to go too heavy into that. And then this also is important to look at what might change the board itself, where a new person actually comes on. So majority voting helps you force the director to think you might be voted out, and thus you get the voice, but having a new board member means you do actually have a new board member, and thus a new voice. And where that's become more prevalent is the push to get female board representation, which means you're either adding a new member or replacing a member with a woman, and this comes with different characteristics. So there's this idea from earlier work that new female board members are not going to be insiders, not part of the old boys club, not the same thinking style, thus more independent, and they often have different sets of skills, including governance skills. You can get an actual government enhancement uh, based on a Laura Starks paper. All right, here's the regression that we're going to use and the plus variations on that in different settings. Question is, E, you know, the, the log of the score, the environmental score, is that related to a bunch of controls, various other industry, country, year fixed effects, and importantly, these governance measures. So that's what we're going to be testing. And finally, the table. So here's what happens when we show the first table, and I want to focus on the right-hand side here, which basically looks at traditional governance mechanisms, as well as our two contemporary mechanisms right here, and what do we find? We find that family control is 10% lower e-scores all around the world. That's a pretty big reduction in environmental performance associated with being controlled by insiders that are part of the family group. We also find a positive effect. So if you have a stronger traditional governance measure, that is maybe you do not have dual class shares, each one of those line items is associated with 3% greater score. And then if you have majority election, a much bigger change in your environmental performance of 7% and a huge change, 14%, if you have a female director. And we find similar results when we use our equally weighted scores. Now you think, okay, that's a standard regression. What about causality? This is always tricky. So you can do several things, and we try. We first do firm fixed effects, so we can control for time invariant unobservables. But then this is important. By looking at these contemporary governance mechanisms with majority voting and do you add a female director to your board, you get a chance to say, was there some exogenous or plausibly exogenous outside pressure that causes the companies in a given country, especially where it might be country level, to <coughs> adopt majority voting or female board representation that's not necessarily happening at the same time that there's an outside pressure that says, you need to increase your environmental performance this year or next year or else. So that's the idea. We're focusing on changes in the firm when there's a push for improved governance in these contemporary measures that's exogenous to the firm. So here's the firm fixed effects model. And what you see here is for firms that adopt, as an example, majority election, there's a 5% higher e-score. So this is controlling for all the firm characteristics plus firm fixed effects. Female director, three percentage points higher. So it, it holds, if you will, when you include firm fixed effects, which is often you know, a reasonable standard for these kind of, of cross-country panel tests. And then when we look at the quasi-natural experiment for majority voting, uh, what happened is in 2006, Canada had this big push from an investor coalition, the Coalition for Good Governance, that said, we want firms to adopt majority voting. So they do so. Uh, and then we look at what happens in Canadian firms with their environmental performance after they adopt it. Then we go out and look, well, let's look around all the countries in the world that we have in our sample, 41 countries. Do we see situations where at the beginning of a 
year, a certain fraction of firms have a majority voting rules, and then at the end of the year, 20 percentage points or greater have that as what, you know, it's an increase by that much. We can't always find evidence what caused it, but our thought is there was some outside pressure to make the firms in that one year adopt a majority voting with a 20 percentage point change. So that's like a broad sample of kind of quasi-natural experiments. So you're, in this regression, you're treated if the firm adopted majority of election rule during the shock window, during this external pressure. And so what we find here is if we just look at Canada, huge change in E if you adopted majority election because of this coalition of good governance, and now that governance has a chance to work, the majority voting for the firms that adopted majority voting that did not have it before this external push, they've got 30% higher. It's a relatively small sample, but it's a big, powerful effect. And then we look at all of these, probably the right-hand one, this includes Canada and a bunch of other countries that had a 20 percentage point change in majority voting in a given year, we see that they also have higher e-performance when those firms were quasi-exogenously forced to adopt majority voting. So some evidence consistent with causality, we always have to be careful in any of these kind of uh, corporate governance and environmental performance models to say what, whether it's really causality, but it's, it's consistent with it. And then we look separately at pressures from external forces to force women to be in on the boards in a greater number. And so the UK, which is quite a large sample country within our sample, in 2011, a big push to basically say, you got four years to get at least 25% female board members, which means there's going to be changes with, with women added to the board. And we look at what happens there, and then we also look at whether 10 percentage points or more women change to be on the board from the start of the year in a country to the end of the year. What's unfortunate for us is the environmental data go back only to 2004 and 5, and a lot of European countries had already forced female board representation to increase by that point. So we can't use a lot of European countries because they, they made their forced exogenous change before our sample. But we do this where you got at least 10% increase or you have it in the UK. And again, for the female board representation, you see exactly that when you are becoming a treated firm, you are forced from some external force to adopt a, a greater percentage of women on the board, you have higher e -sports. And that's across a broad country sample and the UK that specifically had it. So then just to make sure we, we are not missing things here, as I mentioned, there's a lot of concern that environmental performance metrics really are just kind of fuzzy and not measuring stuff. Like, what do they actually capture? So we want to ask in several different tests, do governance effects matter on e-performance where it really matters? That is where the environmental risks are more salient. So we look first at countries that have low e-performance. So here, if you have, if you're a below median environmental scoring country, do things like adding a female director or having family control matter in these low e-performance countries? And they do. So the governance still matters where you would hope you might see an effect, because this is where you need to move the needle on improving environmental performance. Interestingly, Continental Europe, uh, we have a previous paper that shows the social norms matter quite a bit. None of the governance stuff matters, good or bad, in continental Europe, because everybody already has kind of a consensus between the outsiders and the insiders. We want to spend on environmental sustainability, because that's just what we do in continental Europe. But if you look outside continental Europe, you see very strong results, again, on governance. So it depends on the setting where the e-risks are arguably higher. Family-controlled firms, what happens with them? The whole point is they're negative in general. We ask whether the governance mechanism specifically can improve the e-performance in family control firms, and this is a pretty strong result. So you got 10%, oh boy, I went on one minute, I better keep moving. So let me just say that the, the um, female director coefficient is very strong in family control firms, indicating that having a woman on the board will lessen the impact of, uh, the negative impact of family control firms. The other governance mechanisms don't tend to matter. We find that in dirty industries, whoops, sorry, in dirt, oh, can't go back. Well, I'll just, in, in, in dirty industries rather than clean ones, it also matters as well. And then the, the real big thing I want to do as a takeaway is make sure we focus a little bit more on this female board representation. This is a strong statement. The contemporary governance mechanisms of renewing the board by adding a female director is hugely and significantly 
associated with improved environmental performance. Is it because they bring different characteristics or is it because they have actually different preferences towards the environment? So without showing a whole lot of tests, you know, the trade-off is behavioral economics evidence finds that women have stronger other regarding preferences, including the environment, or it could just be that they're younger and have a different thinking. <laughs> so we do a bunch of tests here in these things, and, and just given time, I won't do it. But we basically find that when you look at women and the, the director experience they bring, this is probably a capstone right over here, even when women join the board with below median CEO experience in higher education, which means that they, they don't have the characteristics that are associated with higher environmental performance, there's still a huge jump in environmental performance. So our conclusion there is it must be something related to the, the gender specific characteristics of wanting to improve the environmental performance. So concluding very quickly, we see kind of the roadmap here. Governance is important for investors that want to move the needle on e-performance. It's fundamentally linked and you've got to have it. And then also the female board representation is extremely strong, relatively speaking, in getting improvements in environmental performance. So what you'd want to say on this and that is, if investors want to change the way firms do environmental investments and their ultimate performance, renew the board. Don't just look at is the director independent and can we move that needle, and especially try to push to get female board representation, because it's just a result that is compelling in our, in our particular uh, paper's results. Okay, that's it. I will escape and let the next person up. Thank you, Al. Now let's see what Javier thinks. <laughs> exactly. We're <laughs> clapping for you, by the way. No. <laughs>